Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome on a snowy day here in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. It was a snow day uh, for the schools, but a uh, busy day for, for most everybody else, and I'm glad that you're able to, uh, to come tonight. I apologize after um, taking care of the sidewalk and ramp and stairs. There was no salt left. I guess we thought, that's it for winter. Winter's over. And so uh, please exercise care on your way out. I'll probably forget to say that by the time we're ended, but uh, be careful going down the stairs and down the ramp. And for those of you who are watching from elsewhere, hopefully it is sunny and warm where you are and all thoughts of salt are, are long past, except for salt water in which you may be swimming uh, today. So welcome to, uh, to the study. And we are... Here in Mark chapter 13, I'm just checking the, um, checking the messages that come. If any questions come in as well, they'll appear on my magic watch. Oh, how ministry has changed in all of these years. And uh, any questions left over from last week that we didn't address uh, as yet? No? Everybody's happy? Okay. Let's proceed then. And so Mark 13 Let's begin with verses 1 and 2. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, that's an absolutely astonishing claim to make. But first, back to just a little bit of a background. When I first decided to do a close study of the Gospel of Mark with you, I was, I was looking forward to everything except for chapter 13 because chapter 13 is one of the most difficult chapters in all the Bible to understand and certainly the most difficult in the Gospel of Mark. And I knew it would be difficult to go through, but I think I found a path for us to make our way through this chapter and find out how we can make sense of that for our understanding. And one of the primary reasons that it's difficult to understand is that it's, it seems to be intended for two audiences, each of whom are getting a very specific message about something very specific that's going to happen. And so we have to figure out which audience is which, which one is us, and what is there in this chapter in the Gospel of Mark for those of us in uh, 2022 in, uh, in North America and in other places beyond. Where can this chapter bring us? What can it say to us? So that's the task of tonight, and it is a more difficult task than, uh, than it often is. Now, if you recall for the last couple of weeks, chapters 11 and 12 and now 13 are all largely about the temple and how the age of the temple sacrifices, the whole gang who is running the show, the priestly classes, the, the Sadducees and the Hasmoneans and the, and the, the Pharisees and the, the lawyers and the scribes and the temple officials and the high priests, all these guys, that whole system was coming to an end. And all of that was going to be replaced by Jesus, who was going to be the perfect sacrifice and the great high priest for all people of all the world and for all time. And everything that's been going on in, this, uh, in the prelude to this chapters 11 and 12 has been talking about that. And Jesus has been getting more and more specific about how the temple is going to be overthrown. And remember we talked about the street theater that he was going through, like, like turning over the, the tables of the money changers and and the dove sellers and stopping people from carrying on their temple business. Also, that strange episode of Jesus cursing the fig tree for not providing figs, even though it wasn't even the season for figs. And all those debates that he engages in with the temple officials. All of those things were abundantly clear to the temple hierarchy. So much so that they said, okay, we got to get rid of this guy. We have to kill him. Otherwise, we are finished. But now, Jesus is going to stop using parables, and so he's going to come right out and say, the temple is doomed. It's all coming to an end. It's finished. That, you know, we're looking back 2,000 years. Imagine somebody coming into Zion and saying, you know, before, before this uh, uh, generation is out, there's not going to be one brick 
left standing on top of another. Zion is going to be an empty lot, and all of you will be dispersed. We would say, first of all, uh, well, you're, you're a nutter, and, uh, and secondly, um, you know, I think you're looking for a first Baptist. That's just... just. So look at those stones. Look at those stones the disciples had. It's small wonder the disciples remarked on the size of the stones from the temple and the temple mount. They were constructed of these massive, massive stones that were quarried in quarries nearby. In fact, going right under the temple mount is a massive, massive quarry system, which is very, very neat and mysterious to go through. My son and I went through there called the Caves of Zedekiah, and you go in for hundreds and hundreds of meters underground, and, and you can see where these great, enormous blocks have been hewn out of, the, uh, out of the, the Jerusalem limestone. Now, some of those blocks were the size of transport trailers, and that's not an exaggeration. Almost exactly the size, as a matter of fact, of a transport trailer, size and shape. And the buildings, like the temple itself, was described not only by Jews, but even Romans who would go and visit uh, Jerusalem, mostly soldiers, of course, or diplomats or politicians. They would go back to Rome and say, you know, we got nothing in Rome that can touch this. This is the most spectacular building on the face of the earth. Now, just imagine that, because Rome at that time uh, had been completely remodeled by Augustus. And one of the great historians, might have been Tacitus, said, Augustus came to Rome, which was, uh, he, when he came, it was a city of stone, and when he left, it was a city of marble. And so all of these temples and everything in Rome, but, but the temple in Jerusalem was said to have surpassed them all. Now, here's an example of one of those stones. Here's a, uh, a, a lady for, uh, for scale, one of my tour groups, and on the side, she's, I've sort of got a mirror image of that stone. And of course, the, I can't capture it all in the picture, but the stone that she's leaning against. You can see some smaller blocks underneath. And then the one right above her is 41 feet long and 11 and a half feet high and about 11 and a half or 12 feet deep. Again, so it's slightly larger than a typical transport trailer. And it's stone, solid stone. Now just imagine the engineering required in carving that thing out transporting it there. And it's not even the bottom level of stones. You can see it's sitting on top of some very nicely carved stones as well. And Jesus says, no, these things are all going to be coming, tumbling down. There's not going to be one left on top of another. This, uh, this image is, uh, is one of the ones that I think really captures what Jerusalem would have uh, looked like back then and the massive size of the temple complex. Now, that whole big rectangular project, that's the temple mount, and the temple is the thing sitting right in the middle of it. And you can see there are all kinds of buildings associated with it. On the far right-hand side, that high building there is the Antonia Fortress. That was the, the security building that the, uh, the Romans had constructed to keep an eye on everything that was going on in the temple, because as close to 100,000 people could easily gather on top of that temple mount in that huge plaza. There's not enough detail there to show you uh, the size that a person would be. I can see it as I'm quite close. The people just look like, like little ants. Now, that big square or rectangular thing surrounding, that, that's the temple mount. That's just the platform that was uh, built to make a big level area on the top on which the temple is built. When Jesus talks about one stone not being kept on another, he's talking about the temple complex, all those buildings that are sitting on top of the temple mount. And so Jesus' prophecy, when he said not one stone was left upon another, was proven tragically true. Because the Romans, as we heard in past weeks, they sacked and burned and destroyed the temple so completely that there are very, very sketchy and scant archaeological remains today, hardly any. And the, the temple mount, that big platform upon which the temple stood, which would hold, you know, between six and eight Canadian regulation football fields, if that measurement means anything to you, uh, that was so huge, it actually comprised about 20% 
of the entire uh, area of the inhabited city of Jerusalem. So just imagine how impressive that was and how much it, it, it overtook. And Jesus said, not one of those buildings that are on top, because it mentions that they just left the temple, they just left that center part, and they were in the area of the courtyards. And Jesus points around and says, not one of these buildings is going to be left standing. And indeed, there's the remains of those very buildings right there, which the Romans destroyed. And they not only destroyed them, but they took all the big blocks and they shoved them over the side of the wall. And those blocks remain there to this day. And there they are. This whole area, more or less um, up even a little higher than that sort of dark line that runs along the top. When, uh, when Israel took control of this area in 1967, that was all dirt. All of this was covered in, in dirt and soil. And they excavated all the dirt under the auspices of the archaeologist Dan Bahat. But they left all of these stones which they uncovered in place. None of those stones have been moved. Those are exactly where they fell after the, uh, the Romans threw it all down because they wanted to preserve that to give you this idea of the level of destruction that was there. What was the Romans' objective? Was to completely uh, defeat the will of the people of Jerusalem or of Israel itself to rebel against the Romans. You're going to rebel against us? Okay, we're going to teach you a lesson. And that's the way that the Romans uh, did things. And things really haven't, haven't changed. If you want to demoralize people, what do you do? You bomb their cities. We're seeing that happening today. Romans didn't have bombs, but they had fire and engineers and strong fellows and levers, and this is what they did. So Jerusalem at the time of Christ, you can see uh, that uh, the outline of the Temple Mount and then the red part being the temple itself standing in the middle of it. And that blue outline is the entire surface area of the city. So look how big that complex was when you took into, into consideration the entire city. No wonder the, the disciples were impressed by all that was there. This is more or less what the city would have looked like in the time of Jesus, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. And you can see the big Temple Mount complex. And coming off that Temple Mount towards the right, sort of this uh, lengthy um, dagger-shaped uh, area, that was the original size of the city of Jerusalem uh, when David uh, conquered the city. That is called the Ophel, or the city of David. And then the temple was constructed at the very top, and then the rest of the city began to expand to the area that you can see uh, there. Now, the area of the crucifixion is, uh, is more or less, you see that box that says Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. The top right corner of that box is more or less set where the area of the crucifixion would have been at the time of Jesus. But about 10 years after uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, the uh, walls of the city were expanded to the north. And so as a result, after about 43 or 44 AD, the area of the crucifixion was then within the city walls of Jerusalem. This is what the Temple Mount looks like now. And uh, you can see it's a big empty space now, and right in the middle of it is the, the, sh the, the shrine, um, the Islamic shrine that was built on the top. And then on the uh, left-hand side is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And again, when it's uh, the Muslim holy days or time for prayers, between 50 and 100,000 uh, of the devout will gather on top of the Temple Mount uh, for prayer. This is a bit of a diagram of what it looks like now. You can see the Dome of the Rock in the middle, the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, on the bottom, and the area of the western wall where people go to pray is on the bottom left-hand side. And it's just when you're praying at the western wall, again, I can't emphasize this strongly enough, you're not right up against the temple, you're right up against the temple mount, the big platform upon which the temple was, was constructed. Yes? Not anymore. 
The temple was completely destroyed by the Romans, utterly. Not one stone left on another, and a temple was not rebuilt. The Dome of the Rock, the thing in the, uh, in the middle there, was, uh, was built in the 600s uh, by when the, when the uh, Islamic armies came and conquered Jerusalem. And that was more or less just left empty at the top for 600 years after the destruction of the temple. And then this was, uh, the, the, the Dome of the Rock was built as a shrine. And curiously, it was built to resemble the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It uh, is the same sort of uh, shape and size and construction that the Holy Sepulchre was uh, at that time. And so it was sort of a rival in size and shape. Now, you can't see the Holy Sepulchre in this picture because we're not, we don't go up high enough in this particular photograph. Oh, okay, was it slaves or was it uh, paid builders who built the temple? It was paid builders. Um, in fact, it was one of the largest building projects uh, in the entire Middle East, including Egypt at this time. And one of the interesting things is you can take uh, what's called a uh, temple tunnels walk and go, I think you were on that, Karen, as a matter of fact, and, and go underground from the western wall all along that wall of the, of the temple mount that's on the left-hand side of the, of the image here and come out at the, uh, at the far end on the Via Dolorosa. And as you're very near the end of that, it's all nicely carved stuff and all, and all of a sudden the nice carving stops and it's raw rock again. And you can just see where the workmen laid down their chisels and walked. And why did they lay down their chisels and walk? Because that's the exact moment at which King Herod had died. And so the financing for the construction of the temple stopped. And these workers said, we're, we're not, we're not going to put one more chisel to the rock until we know we're going to get paid. And they didn't. And that's as far as that construction went. So we actually have an archaeological moment frozen in time. I wish I would have anticipated that question. I could have shown you that really interesting photograph of just everything stopping work and and the, the workers going away. So they were paid. It's uh, the, one of the popular misconceptions about the constructions of the pyramids in Egypt as well, is that it was built by slave labor, but it wasn't. They were paid workers who constructed those things. There were other projects going on in, uh, in Egypt that weren't, but this was all paid labor. Now, I don't think anybody's getting rich on it. So that whole thing was destroyed, and that's what we're left with now. And you can imagine the disciples saying, what are you talking about? So they leave the temple, they walk across the Kidron, they go up to the Mount of Olives, and now they're looking over this whole thing, and the disciples are thinking, what is it? One stone left on the other. And so then Mark continues his story. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? When will the temple be destroyed? When will the Jewish faith as they know it be forever changed? Because things don't stay the same when you destroy the temple. The two of them go hand in hand. That much the disciples had figured out. Now, there's some of a poignant thing that strikes me about this passage. Jesus now four times has very clearly said to the disciples, I am going to die. I'm, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to be falsely convicted, I'm going to be crucified, and then I'm going to rise again. Not once did the disciples ask him, when is this going to happen? But when Jesus says the temple is going to be destroyed, when is this going to happen? That, that seems to be for them a bigger deal. And so Jesus is going to answer their question. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and he will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. Now, What's going on there? Well, one of the limitations of being human 
And as I get older, I'm discovering more and more limitations. But one of the limitations of being human is that we view time in a linear fashion. One thing follows another in chronological order. This happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. But this chapter in Mark doesn't follow human chronology. Jesus is looking ahead to what will come, and he doesn't list it first this, then this, then this, then this, then this in order. It's sort of like looking at a mountain range and saying, oh, look at that mountain. Oh, look at that mountain with the peak. Oh, but that's not the first mountain. There's another mountain in front of it. We're not sure which mountain Jesus is referring to. Now, he is looking ahead to what will come, and he's giving important warnings. And some of those warnings are right around the corner. They're just about to happen. And some of those warnings are, are many, many years away. But one of the things we have to get in our head about this chapter is that the immediate focus is not us. The immediate focus is the audience of Jesus, the people listening to him right then, and the people of Mark's day. Now, Mark is writing this gospel. The earliest people who, were, who knew Mark and who knew John or who knew the people who knew them were talking about the gospel of Mark as having been written around 60 A.D. Okay, so Mark writes this stuff down around 60 A.D., Almost 100% the Gospel of Mark is in circulation by 65 AD. The destruction of the temple isn't going to take place for another five years. Okay, so for Mark as well, this is stuff that, you know, is still in the future, but when? And there was no hint in 65 AD that there was going to be a civil war and the Romans were going to come in and destroy the temple. So... The people in Mark's day are needing to know this stuff as a warning of stuff that is to come. And one of the things Jesus warns them about is false messiahs. Now, notably, some of those were leaders within the insurrectionist zealots. You hear about the zealots. One of Jesus' disciples was a zealot, but apparently Jesus calmed them down. And the zealots were a very, very uh, revolution-based political party. If you could call it that, it's not like they had elections, but they were against the ruling political classes. They were dedicated to evicting the Romans from Israel and restoring the former glory of the country. They hated every Roman that they saw. And they managed finally to gain enough power and influence that they sparked a rebellion in 66 A.D., leading to the Roman invasion and then ultimately to the destruction of the temple and the complete subjugation of the land by 70 A.D. The Romans came in with a very, very, very heavy hand. And so those were false messiahs. We're going to deliver Jerusalem. God is going to establish his kingdom on earth through us, they said. And there were... Um, Eliezer ben Yair, that's, boy, I couldn't get the guy's name in my head. I'm sure all of you were thinking, Eliezer ben Yair. Eliezer ben Yair was one of the primary zealots of that time. And he actually led the contingent of zealots, who the small contingent who escaped Jerusalem through the sewers and eventually made their way to Masada, but that's another story. Now, another false messiah at a later date was a guy named Simon bar Kochba, and he claimed actually to be the Messiah. And he led a rebellion in 132 A.D. because 60 years after the original rebellion, enough, enough Jews had returned to the area that he gathered a, a force and he was momentarily successful in throwing the Romans out until once again the Romans came back and now, now they weren't fooling around, not that they were before. But you might have heard of Emperor Hadrian, the guy who built Hadrian's Wall. The emperor Hadrian led his forces in. He laid waste to the country, so utterly destroyed and dismantled Jerusalem that the city was completely rebuilt and renamed. The name Jerusalem disappeared, and the city was renamed as Aeolia Capitolina, the capital of the Aelia family, which was Hadrian's family. Not only did he change the name of the city of Jerusalem, he changed the name of the entire country of Judea. Remember, Israel was no longer the name of the whole country. Now it was called Judea and Galilee. And in 132 AD, do you know what Hadrian changed the name of Judea to? 
Palestine. Palestine. And he named it Palestine after the traditional enemies, the ancient enemies of the Jewish people, the Philistines. And the Philistines had their kingdom where more or less the Gaza Strip is now. Goliath was a Philistine, for instance. All the way through the Old Testament, there's always fighting with the Philistines. And so Hadrian erased the name Jerusalem and erased the name Judea, renamed the whole country so that it would never rebel again. He even rebuilt the floor plan of the city, and this is more or less the outline of the city as we see it today. And it's not the outline, if you recall what the outline looked like in the days of Jesus, like that, okay? Now the outline under the Romans looked like this, and that's more or less the location of the walls of the city today. Now what is, you can see the temple of where the temple was before, Hadrian constructed a temple to Jupiter, and where Golgotha was, where the crucifixion of Jesus has happened, he constructed a temple to Venus right, to completely destroy and to obliterate the evidence of the Jewish religion and the superiority of the Roman religion of the Jewish religion. He built a Roman temple on top of the site of the Jewish temple. And to obliterate the Christian religion, which was rising up at this time, he built a temple on top of the area of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, where pilgrims had been going and visiting and praying. Rome is more, our, our gods are mightier than your gods, said Hadrian. He also built a temple on top of the grotto of the nativity in Bethlehem because people were visiting that, the birthplace of Jesus. So in 136, Hadrian built a temple on top of that. What he ended up doing accidentally is preserving those sites <laughs> because people go, you know, where was the crucifixion? Oh, well, Hadrian built that temple. So now they knew exactly where that was. Where was Jesus born? Oh, Hadrian built that. So now they knew exactly where that was. It ended up preserving the areas. But what's interesting here, and whenever I say that's interesting, it usually means it's interesting to me and not likely to you. At the top of this, you'll see a street coming in and then kind of a little semicircular thing. That's the area of the Damascus Gate. It's right near the top, kind of a little semicircular thing. And then there's two roads which come out from there. You see those two roads? Every Roman city has a main road going north to south it's called the Cardo. Cardo, like cardia, cardia, like the heart of the city. And that main road will go right through the heart. And then there's a road that goes from west to east, east to west, called the Decomanus. So every Roman city is built on this plan. You've got one main street coming this way, main street coming this way. In Jerusalem, there's two cardos that come down, one that comes down against the Temple Mount and one that comes down against the city. Those streets are still there. That's the street plan of the old city of Jerusalem to this day. In fact, on that very top where that, uh, where that uh, semicircular uh, entranceway to the city is, this is what the Damascus Gate looks like today. Okay, so that's the one at the very top, the Damascus Gate on the north side of the city. But can you see, I wish I had a, you know, we don't have enough money here for a laser. I wish we had a laser. The main door going into Damascus Gate. Now, if you look lower and to the left, you'll see another dark archway. That's actually the ancient Roman level gate. There it is there, see, down the bottom. Now, if you go through that gate, you're actually on Roman street level. Not modern street level, but Roman street level. It's about 20 feet, 25 feet lower. And this is what it would have looked like in Roman times. That was the main gate into the city, the start of the Cardo. At the start of every Cardo in the Roman Empire, you had a big pillar. And from that pillar, that was like the main pillar post, and you can say, okay, this is 10 stadia that way, that's 10 stadia that way, you turn left at the pillar. You ever see, by Cow's Ice Cream here in Charlottetown, there's still one of the city pillars here from when the city was founded. You ever seen that little pillar just outside of Cow's? Same sort of idea here. 
And then if you went down that way, you ended up more or less passing the area of the crucifixion. If you went that way, you ended up passing the area of the temple. Uh, they've excavated this area, and you can see at the, at the bottom, just near the left, kind of a round beginning of a pillar. That marks the location of that original Roman pillar. They've uncovered this whole area. Now, I've got circled in red on the left-hand side. This is the Madaba map. This is a big mosaic map about the size of the platform here uh, in Madaba in Jordan, and it's a map of Jerusalem, ancient Roman Jerusalem, or Elia Capitolina. And you can see that pillar on the left-hand side, and you can see the cardo that goes right through, straight, and you can see that other cardo, the second cardo, which angles along the top towards the temple, the temple mount. So that is still there. And so when Jesus says every stone is going to be knocked down, ultimately, almost every stone in the whole city was knocked down, and the whole city was rebuilt as a Roman capital. And even the name was changed. So that prophecy came true in the, in the most horrible possible of ways. Now, Jesus mentions earthquakes and... Fa oh, any questions before? I'm just roaring on here. No? Yes? Alia Capitolina is the, was the name given to Jerusalem. Palestine was the name given to the country. The whole country. Jesus mentions earthquakes and famines. So he mentions not one stone on top of another, mentions all kinds of false prophets, false messiahs coming up. We've got records of all of those. We've got the consequences of those. Now he's going to mention earthquakes. And there's two such quakes, one in the 300s and the one in the 600s that caused horrific destruction from which the entire country never really recovered until just very, very recent years, in fact. This is Bet Shean. This is one of the largest cities that existed in, Jerusalem, in uh, Israel at the time. It's just south, maybe 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers south of the Sea of Galilee. And the earthquake was so severe that the ground lifted up and fell down, and all these massive pillars, which would have been 20, 30 feet high, just boof, completely fell down on each other. This is, gives you an idea. This, this pillar would be... Um, if I were standing in front of this pillar, I could, would be able to barely reach the top of it. So huge and massive. And these just completely collapsed, and the entire city was destroyed and never settled again. And this happened throughout Israel. Uh, one of the structures that was destroyed was the synagogue in Capernaum that Jesus did his teaching and healing in, and that was rebuilt uh, in the 300s uh, by a Roman benefactor, believe it or not. There's also a record, not only in the 300s and 600s, but there's a record in the Gospels of a less destructive but still noteworthy earthquake which struck during the time of the crucifixion itself. And there is, in fact, seismic evidence that that quake was centered down in the Dead Sea. Why are all those earthquakes? The Jordan River is along the Jordan Valley. And the Jordan Valley is called the Jordan Rift. And on one side, you've got one tectonic plate. On the other side, you've got another tectonic plate. And every once in a while, those shift like this and cause incredible earthquakes and volcanoes. There are volcanoes uh, in, the, in the northern part of Israel, which as a result of that tectonic shifting. In fact, geologists have demonstrated that by this area of, uh, of Bet Shean here, which is quite close to the Jordan, if you go directly over to the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River from there, and you look at rocks, so rock formations. And so, okay, this rock formation, here's a big a strain of quartzite going through the Jerusalem uh, uh, limestone that's there. To find where that continues on the other side of the Jordan, you have to go 100 meters up because the whole thing shifted like that, 100 meters. Now, can you imagine? if along Great George Street and University Avenue, if all of a sudden one side of the street was 100 meters different than the other side of the street, there wouldn't be much left of Charlottetown. That's the power of these earthquakes. Now, the one that happened 
in, uh, at the time of the crucifixion wasn't quite as severe, but it did cause damage. So we hear about this in Matthew 27. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. It's entirely possible that this is the memory of one of those earthquakes that happened there. There's almost always small seismic earthquakes going on in Jerusalem that are just very small to feel, but every once in a while, they have a, a substantial one. As for famines, they were also distressingly frequent. There was a severe famine as a result of a major Nile flood in 45 AD. And Egypt was the breadbasket of the empire. Right now, the war in Ukraine is threatening a lot of famine in the world because Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe and Eastern Europe and Northern Africa. Their major export is wheat. There ain't going to be any wheat this year because the farmers are busy towing tanks and uh, not uh, able to plow and plant their fields. So Egypt was the Ukraine of the day, but responsible for even more of the food of the empire. And because the Nile flooded, they weren't able to plant that year. And as a result, in 46, there was a tremendous famine. Now, how do we know about this flood in 45? This is the floor of a church in Tabcha. And Tabcha is where the, we remember the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Now, in Tabcha, there's a beautiful mosaic floor. As you can see, this is the original floor of a church that had been built there in uh, the early 300s. What's interesting is that the floor doesn't represent life around the Sea of Galilee. It represents life along the Nile. Because what happened in those days, well, you would bring in mosaic craftsmen from various parts of the world, and they would show you pictures of beautiful floors they could build. And here they picked a floor that depicts what happens in the Nile. Amazing. This is in just by the Sea of Galilee, and they buy essentially a stone carpet designed in Egypt and maybe even put together by Egyptian craftsmen. And that thing that you see there is a water depth of the Nile meter. And every year they'd say, and the letters from the bottom, that's the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, then they put in sigma, zeta, eta, theta, iota, and so on. So all oh, the floods were high this year. We had, we had epsilon-level floods. But the flood in 45 was so deep that this beautiful mosaic in Sepphoris, also in Israel, depicts a Nilometer. You can see the wavy Nile underneath and all the, the naked guys running around who swim uh, in the Nile. And this is a, just a small section of a very large mosaic. And the flood was so deep that you can see there's a guy having to stand on another guy's back and carve a new number in the top of the Nilometer to describe just how deep that flood was. And as a result of that flood that we have recorded here and in other places, there was a huge famine in the land. Now, the Apostle Paul speaks often of the special offerings taken up to relieve the Jerusalem famine. And you can see how Jesus' words about, you know, watch out, there's going to be famine, were very applicable for the people of his day. Fifteen years after Jesus spoke the words, people are saying, remember, Jesus said that this was going to happen. And he said, when this happens, watch out. Watch out. Now, it's important to take note that Jesus speaks of all of these things that are to come as a beginning, not as an end. The end is still to come, he actually says. These are the beginning of birth pains. They're not the end. One of the things people always assume when they read this is, oh, that's the sign of the end. Everything's going to come to an end. Well, it's the beginning of the birth pains. A new world order is being birthed and indeed is going to come. And the faith is going to move out from Jerusalem to points further than the disciples can ever imagine. Remember, birth pains are the beginning of something. Now, I myself have never given birth. I know this is a shock to many of you. But I have seen women 
having birth pains, when birth pains beginning. Oh, oh boy. And then the husband gets all nervous and starts running around the house. That's what I did anyway. But oh, and you might be in for quite a long process. Okay, it could be, could be days before, or it could be one of those false labors. And it could be another several weeks until the baby is born. I'm using technical terms here. I'm not an obstetrician. Many of you have figured that out. But it's the beginning of something that's going to happen. And what is that going to be? So Jesus says, when you see these things beginning, you must be on your guard. You're going to be handed over to local councils, flogged in the synagogues. Okay, these are the birth pains, the pains. On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. It's not going to be easy, says Jesus. Now, it must have been difficult for the disciples to grasp this. But, and he says, whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And one of the great... Uh, evangelistic uh, moments of the early church was in fact the, uh, the witness that people were given when they were in trial. What's this ridiculous business that you are gathering together on Sunday mornings for? Well, sir, we, we are worshiping Jesus the Messiah. Well, what on earth is that? And then the people would tell the story of their faith, and that was one of the ways in which the faith grew. There were even Christians who, of course, were killed and would proclaim their faith prior to their death, and they would not recant. And the early church always said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's how the church grew, was because of the witness of the martyrs. Now, a martyr, the word martyr, means witness. Someone who's telling the story is a martyr. Okay, so these... When Jesus is saying, you're going to be arrested, you're going to have to, have to testify, don't worry, God will give you the words to say. Okay. So Jesus often speaks of the disciples spreading the gospel through the whole world to all nations, but the spread wouldn't be easy. They'd face great resistance from their own faith, from Judaism, which regarded Christianity as an increasingly dangerous and radical sect. And once it was out, once Christianity was no longer under the protection afforded the Jews by the Romans, Christians would be persecuted by the state as well. See, Jesus even says, brother will betray brother to death, a father, his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Families are being split apart by the faith. Now, by the end of the first century, the Roman government had turned against Christians. Why? Christians were originally regarded by the Romans as Jews, a particularly crazy sect of Jews, but Jews nonetheless. Now, Jews had special rights and privileges within the Roman Empire. One of them was they didn't have to work on the Sabbath. The Romans thought it was crazy that the Jews would take a day off every week, but they recognized it and enshrined it as law that they wouldn't be compelled to work on the Sabbath. They were also excused from sacrificing to the emperor, which was very important because the Jews would have considered that you, you couldn't do that. You couldn't bow to the emperor as God. And so the Romans excused them that as a result of, uh, of other developments. There were also various tax uh, breaks and so on that was involved in being a Jew. It didn't mean it was easy to be a Jew, but you were given kind of special considerations. Now, when the Jews began to regard Christians as dangerous and began to say to the Romans, look, these Christians, they're, they're not Jews. They're something else. We're the Jews. They're, they're a radical thing. They've broken off from us. Then the Romans said, okay, well, then the Christians are no longer under the protection that the Jews had. And as a result, you Christians are going to have to sacrifice to the emperor. You Christians are not going to be able to have houses of worship all of your own. You can't have your own synagogues and so on and so forth. And that's how the Christians began to be really getting into trouble in the Roman Empire. 
It's also why in Gospels like the Gospels of John, there seems to be a lot of hostility against the Jews and against the whole temple structure. Why? Because they were basically uh, endangering the entire future of Christianity by setting them against the Romans, the Romans against them. So it's an inter-family conflict which becomes very, very serious. And families were pressured to report anyone who was not loyal to Caesar. Oh, you know, my brother-in-law, he doesn't sacrifice to the emperor. And he's not a Jew, but he doesn't sacrifice. Oh, well, you know, okay, well, you can have his house, you know, and, uh, and we're going to take this guy away to jail. Within some Jewish families, loved ones who believed that their relatives who followed Jesus had joined a terrible extremist sect. They had left the faith. They're going to bring the wrath of the Romans upon them. And even because of a misunderstanding of what communion was, and John talks about this in the Gospel of John chapter 6, some mistakenly believed that Christians were cannibals and literally eating human flesh and human blood. So, the religion was going to be wiped out. It was not tolerated, and Christians were badly persecuted. So Jesus is warning them about this. And he also says, and this is when it really gets obscure, not that it hasn't been obscure yet, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. So when you see these things happening, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, run, says Jesus, run. Now, obviously, this is for the people of the day. And he writes, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be the days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them, said Jesus. Now remember, when Mark published his gospel, all of this was still to come. So this was important news and an important guide to the Christians of the first century. Jesus is talking particularly to them and particularly to the church in Israel and Jerusalem. You recall he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, why specifically them? Because by the time the Romans come down with their invasion, Christianity has spread to other parts of the empire. The Apostle Paul has taken it all the way to Greece. Why the Judea? Well, that's where the Romans are going to come. Now, the key to understanding these verses is figuring out what Jesus means by the abomination that causes desolation. And the phrase comes from the book of Daniel, to which Mark may be referring, or in fact is referring, when he inserts the words, let the reader understand. Remember back in this verse a couple of, chapter, of pages ago. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. That is Mark saying, oh, remember, Daniel said this. Because Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, starts chapter 9 this way. Know and understand this. Let the reader understand. Mark, Mark is saying... Remember that thing from Daniel that begins, let the reader understand, no one understand this? And here comes some really obscure stuff from Daniel. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, everybody understand what's going on there? No, nobody understands what's going on. You know who else didn't understand? Daniel didn't have a clue. 
the angel Gabriel, Daniel says, is dictating this stuff to him. And from that time to Jesus, people were saying, what on earth does this mean? I don't know. Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Very confusing stuff. But Jesus is making a reference here because Daniel's talking about the destruction of the temple and invading armies. And he's talking about this abomination that causes desolation as being the sign. So take away all those things with the sevens. You got guys, you know, on TV like, who was this guy a few years ago said the world was going to end and he died first, the old fellow? Or, or John Hagee is very big on these. When I was first a Christian in the, uh, the mid-70s, um, this kind of end time stuff was very big. Hal Lindsey uh, was, was very, very, you know, the, the late great planet Earth and, and books like this. Do you ever remember any of those things at all? Did they filter all the way down here to Prince Edward Island? That was big stuff back then because they felt that they had figured out all of these sevens. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, thought he had figured out all these things. Um, you know, Pope Gregory back in 900 thought he had figured out all these things. Everybody so far has been wrong. But when Jesus says, watch out when this stuff from Daniel seems to be happening, like this abomination that causes desolation, when that occurs in the temple, a sacrilege that is so appalling that the Jews are willing to abandon it, Jesus says, you're going to see it, you're going to see this abomination standing where it does not belong. Figure that out, we've got to go back to the rebellion of 66 to 70 again, because that's what this whole passage is about. After the time of Jesus, the difficult political atmosphere in Judea and Galilee got even worse. The zealots pushed for Judah, Jewish freedom until 66 AD when they finally convinced enough Jews to initiate a full-scale rebellion. Started in Caesarea Maritima on the coast and then spread in. Fanatically caught up in their cause, the zealots moved into the temple and made it their fort. They had no respect for the uh, high priests and the sanctity of it at all. Jews who opposed their insurrection were slaughtered. And accounts from the day, such as Josephus, says that as many Jews were killed by Jews as by the Romans. And according to Josephus, the zealots, and Josephus was, was there at the time, uh, the zealots treated the Holy of Holies as just another room. They murdered some of the prisoners, their so-called prisoners of war, in the temple itself. And they were offended by how corrupt the previous temple leaders had been, and so they satirically ordained a clown, a professional clown named Fanny, to be the, he wasn't very funny, to be the high priest and set him up in the Holy of Holies. So a complete desecration of the temple. And first century Christians believed that Fanny and the, the desecration of the temple by the zealots was indeed the appalling sacrilege standing where he did not belong. They said, you know what? This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. We got to get out of here. And they did. And the Christians, largely, almost entirely, the entire Christian community in Jerusalem, and that was, you know, by far the largest concentrations of Christians on the planet at the time, they fled. Not to the hills of Judea, but beyond. Just over the Jordan River to a mountain town called Pella in Jordan. Now, unfortunately, other people followed Jewish tradition and they stayed behind in Jerusalem. God will take care of us. God will take care of us. Well, it was the Romans who took care of them, unfortunately. Now, our friend Bishop Eusebius, who we've been often quoting, in the early 300s, he wrote about this. He says, the whole body of the church at Jerusalem removed from the city and lived at a certain town beyond the, beyond the Jordan. This is very, I, I wish it would have, destruction of the temple would have been a better time for that. Is that me? And Master Calvin's blaming it on me. I'll keep this right here. I won't touch it. This is a special effect about the destruction of Jerusalem. They, they went to a town called Pella, and there those who believed in Christ, Eusebius writes, removed from Jerusalem as if holy men had entirely abandoned the royal city itself and the, and the whole land of Judea. 
let me just clear my batteries up here. Maybe this is over here. When in, when in doubt, fool around with the batteries. So where is Pella? Am I still live here on this thing? Um, you see where Jerusalem is at the bottom. <laughs> you see the little circle up at the top is Pella. Wow. The little circle up at the top is Pella. Pella is the little circle at the top. You see. There, yeah, this seems to be doing it here. This is microphone. This was. I, uh, am I dead now? Well, I'm not dead, unfortunately, says Calvin. Thanks. You should have been an emergency room doctor. Just a, a, a hand on the mic. Okay, hang on. Put this here. Yeah. Or largely Jews stayed behind. Eusebius says all the Christians head for the hill. The, the church basically got together and said, okay, look, folks, we're, we're out of here. We got to get out of here. This is, this is all going to come to an end. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. So they did. Now, the important thing here is that the Romans, when they were coming into Judea to conquer it, they came in uh, just above where it says Samaria, but on the Mediterranean coast. And they came in. I think the problem was here, Calvin, so if I'm holding this, I'm going to be okay. Thank you. There's the backup. Turn on the yellow, Phyllis. God bless you. Phyllis is laughing. <laughs> so the important thing about Pella is it's across the Jordan, and it's in the area of the Decapolis. And the Decapolis was Gentile territory. And the Decapolis was settled by former Roman soldiers. And so the Roman army didn't go in and bother anybody in the Decapolis. And so the Christians fled to the Decapolis, and they were safe. They were able to survive the great Jewish civil war. Because in AD 70, a Roman general named Titus marched thousands of soldiers into Jerusalem, slaughtered the Jews that remained. And in a hopeless last stand, the zealots took shelter in the, in the massive temple. Titus set fire to the thing. The Romans stoked the fire so hot that it made the marble stones crumble. Are we on with this thing? Made the marble. Oh, boy, look at that. I feel important. We'll turn that off. Turn this on. Am I good? Thank you. So the stones of the temple crumpled. The golden roof melted into the masonry. All of the zealots perished except for a small group that escaped through the sewers and made their way to Masada. I've actually walked through those sewers that they escaped through. And uh, they've just been recently excavated. And it's as much fun as you'd think walking through a sewer would be. And the temple itself was utterly destroyed. So those Christians who heeded the warning of Jesus, they survived. I'm going to pick this up and hold it in my hand so, it's, so we're not getting feedback. And they returned to Jerusalem by 90 AD or so. So 20 years after this, the Christians came back. They began rebuilding their lives as best they could. There's compelling archaeological evidence that they even built a Christian synagogue church on Mount Zion, the very location of the building in which the Last Supper was held. The Last Supper building had been ruined, but a new structure was, was built there on its uh, foundations. There's also evidence that they continue to visit the site of the crucifixion and the resurrection. In fact, we have graffiti... Uh, in the very bottom parts of the Church of the Resurrection that predated the current construction by people who have come to visit. And they've written, uh, Lord, we have come, uh, in the graffiti that was there before Hadrian's destruction. So here's this Madaba map uh, that I visited in Madaba in Jordan. And the Jerusalem part is near the top. Now, here you can see what it looked like after Hadrian rebuilt it. But what's very interesting is I've got three circles there. Remember that pillar, at the, which is on the left-hand side, in the streets that came out? 
In the middle, you see a big circle. That's the area of the crucifixion and resurrection. And that circle is around the big church that was ultimately built there in the 300s when the whole area was Christianized by Constantine. That other circle is one of the other great churches called the Nea Church, which was built. And right beside the Nea Church, you see this little special effect? See the smaller thing? There's a little building attached to the Nea Church, which was called the Church of the Apostles. And that church is identified by scholars and by early Christians as that worship house that was built uh, in 90 AD when the Christians came back to Jerusalem. And that survived until the Muslim conquest in the 600s. And if you visit that exact site today, you can see this building, which is not a very impressive looking building, but if you look at that area right there and get a close up, can you see how there's bigger blocks there, smoother blocks as opposed to the small bricks that are all around it? That shows you that this larger, ugly building was built using foundation stones of a building that was built there before. And those foundation stones date back to 90 AD when the church built its first dedicated meeting house in Jerusalem. And if you visit that place today and you go upstairs, this is what you now find. This is not the original room of the Last Supper. This is only a thousand years old, but it was built by Christians visiting and it is now known as the Upper Room or the Cenacle, the Room of the Last Supper. So again, this room was built a thousand years after the original Last Supper, but built, as far as we can tell, and as far as archaeological evidence points to, on the very same site as the, church of the, la as the place of the Last Supper. So Jesus continues, if anyone says, here's the Messiah, there he is, don't believe it. There's going to be false messiahs, false prophets. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. Jesus warns his followers, be watchful and discerning. Don't fall for those who would deceive the faithful for power or for profit. This is pointed out in a very early Christian manual of belief called the Didache or the teaching. And in about 90 AD it was written. And here's what it says. Let every apostle, who is a messenger of the word, who comes to you be received as the Lord. But he shall not remain for more than one day or two days if there is a need. But if he remains three days, he's a false prophet. And when the apostle goes away, let him take nothing but bread until he lodges. If he asks for money, he's a false prophet. Whoever says in the spirit, give me money or something else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tells you to give for others' sake who are in need, let no one judge him. Now, you could say that we're on TV because we're on YouTube. But one of the things we don't ask for is, uh, is money. Okay? And the Didache warns you. If, if somebody seems to be spending more time asking you for money for themselves than for anything else, false prophet. Jesus says, in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Jesus is quoting Isaiah again, his favorite prophet, speaking about how the world of first century Judaism and Christianity is soon going to be utterly changed. And Isaiah's words refer to the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. And Jesus speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans. Isaiah's words about Assyria, where the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light, the rising sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars in the sky will be dissolved, the heavens rolled up like a scroll, all the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. There's the fig tree uh, again. And then Jesus zips into a saying regarding the second coming. At that time, and now Jesus is looking at a distant mountain. People will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So Jesus up to this point has been talking about the destruction of the temple and the need of everybody to flee. Now he's talking about his own return. 
The early church assumed that that return would be sooner rather than later. So soon that the Apostle Paul, in his early letters, writes to churches expecting the swift return of Jesus. And in his later letters, written 15 years later, he's saying, you know, get ready for the long haul. In fact, some people believe that those who are already dead might miss out on Jesus' return. They anticipated the return as being so imminent that, oh no, if some uncle, uncle Arnie died, he's going to miss out on the return of Jesus. And so Paul had to write the church in Thessalonica in about 46, 47 AD that the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. People expected it imminently. We've come to understand that it's going to be a longer time. Here's an interesting clue from the Gospel of John about this tension and uncertainty. The Gospel of John ends this way. Jesus and Peter are walking along the beach. They've done the Peter, do you love me thing. And then Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, who was the youngest disciple, was following them. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Because Jesus had just predicted Peter's ultimate death. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? You must follow me. And then the writers of John add this. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Now, unlike all the other disciples, John lived until his 90s. And people assumed Jesus was going to return before John died because of this thing. But after John dies and they put together this gospel of his writings, they add this note. You know, John died, we realize Jesus hasn't come back. Obviously, many people, including us, have misunderstood this passage. So Jesus talks again about the fig tree. When, it's, when all this stuff is happening... You know what's coming. Then he says, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So Jesus is very clearly saying, the destruction of the temple is going to take place within a generation, which back then was regarded as 40 years. He's not talking about his return. He's talking about the destruction of the temple. And he's answering the question posed by the disciples way back at the beginning of the chapter. When Jesus said, temple's coming down, when's this going to happen? This generation will not pass away. And it will indeed happen, and in fact, it did. When's the second coming going to happen? Now Jesus says, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And now comes Jesus' words for us. Everything else at this point has been for first century Christians. And now finally... At the end, seven minutes late, here comes Jesus' words for us. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know when the owner of the house is going to come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So Jesus now seems to be speaking both to those people in Jerusalem at the time, watch out, you're going to be ready for, to run. But now he seems to be looking ahead to the time of his return, the second coming. And that parable doesn't make sense only in the context of the Roman invasion, but it does in the context of his return. And so the lesson for us in this whole chapter because we don't have to run. We're not in Judea. We don't have to run from the Romans. But throughout this whole chapter, Jesus has said to us, we need to watch, remain alert. We need to be about the master's business. We need to continually, faithfully share the gospel to all the corners of the earth. Ultimately, despite the difficult days ahead, God is in control and Jesus will return. I, yeah, thanks. I, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to crawl out of here on my hands and knees. Between that and all the technical stuff, this is a hard chapter. A hard chapter. 
If you want to discourage somebody from reading the New Testament, send them to John chapter 9, 13, or Mark chapter 13 and tell them to start there. It's hard stuff. But as you can see, it saved the lives of the early church and allowed the church to be able to continue to flourish and to continue after they safely returned from Pella. And for us, the warning is be alert, be busy, be about the master's business. And that's the lesson for us today as well. Now, next week, we're in more familiar territory with the passion narrative that begins in Mark chapter 14, just in time for us to observe Easter. Before that, let's pray. Dear God, with all the events in the world today, we are facing increased uncertainty again. We're even afraid once again, as we were in the past, about nuclear war and the destruction that that could bring. Help us to be watchful. Help us to take note of the events that are happening in the world, but may that give us a sense of urgency to spread your word and to do the work that you've given us to do. May we always look for your coming and take comfort in that and an inspiration to keep at the task we ask in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in. Sorry about the audio difficulties that we had. Sorry to uh, Pat and the Elephant for keeping Brett here a little longer. Believe me, we wanted to get rid of him earlier, but he wouldn't go. So God bless you all here and there.